Hello, everybody, and welcome to another exciting episode of Office Hours. It's going to be exciting, I promise. I checked the tables. I rolled this morning. We got exciting. That's the emotion. This is episode number 63 of Office Hours. And you might be asking yourself, what is this? What am I watching? Well, it's an advice show. Yes, that's right. I'm going to dispense some Game Master advice. So the jam is... You, or someone very much like you, has visited my website, www.adam-coble.com. There's a link up at the top. It says Office Hours. They've clicked it. They've filled in a form. They've clicked Submit. And I have gotten the question. Digging through the questions, finding the good stuff, I've selected three this week. We're going to answer them. I'm going to talk about the issues. We're going to get into it. I hope at the very least that today's episode answers the three questions that were asked, but I also hope that it helps you, even if this isn't your question, get a little bit of a better handle on how you can be a better tabletop role-playing game game master. Because that's my goal. That is that is the job of today's episode and the 62 episodes prior to this. I want to make you better at the thing that you obviously love doing. So let me see if I can help. We're going to start helping today. We're going to start helping by discussing this with someone named Brian. Hello, Adam. My name is Brian, or Mixalide on the Discord chat. I am going to be taking three of my uh, good friends through their first time playing tabletop role-playing games in a few weeks, probably Apocalypse World or award-winning tabletop RPG Dungeon World. And I was wondering what some of your favorite uh, tricks tropes or plot twists are to use on new players who are not familiar with the genre. Uh, things that maybe experienced players might see coming or be uh, uninspired by, but that new players will, will think are amazing and fun. Uh, thank you. And as always, your show is fantastic. So this is, this is so good. This is such a great question because I would never... I would never have imagined to ask this question personally. Like, I'm so deep in my experience as a, as a game master uh, that I, I have forgotten. Like, the, the idea that I would ever call on these old tropes just wouldn't have occurred to me. But I, I love the idea of I've got these, these new players and they've never experienced role playing games in the way that uh, that many of us have. And now I can bring out these old standards, right? And I can I can show them off, and we can all have a we can all have a giggle. So I think let, let's talk about the rest of us for a minute. Let's talk about the the experienced role players. Right? Let's let's talk about the the jaded folk who have done who have done the thing. So. As an experienced role player, you know, we're, we're constantly looking at things like, and I know everybody was thinking this, I promise the first thing that everybody thought of when this question was being asked is, you meet in a tavern. You meet in the tavern is the ultimate top of the line grade A meme. It is the, the memeiest of all possible memes as far as tabletop role playing games go. I know that's what you thought of. Right? So we're looking at these things like characters meeting in a tavern or like answering riddles to open dungeon doors. And we're a bunch of jaded oldsters. So we're like, okay, all right. Well, that's a tired cliche. We're, we're just not going to do that, right? Folks who have this, this deep pedigree in the nerdly arts of role playing, you know, we've, we've seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail a bunch of times, right? We, we know Lord of the Rings inside and out. We have all quested into the cellar to kill 10 rats for the innkeeper, right? Some of us have read every book in Appendix N. Some of us have watched every episode of role play and critical role that there is to watch. We've gone beyond the popcorn cinema TV tropes of what's expected, and we spend almost all of our time trying to GM like we're fucking Tarkovsky, right? Like, it's... It's cool, right? It's cool to be nuanced and subtle. It's cool to twist the paradigm and, and do weird new shit. But it's interesting to remember that not everybody, just like Brian pointed out, not everybody is as 
blasé about the things that we're blasé about, right? For every single one of us who has read all the Conan stories, there is 20 people, 100 people, 1,000 people to whom the name Conan means ginger talk show host, not rippling thews, right? Now, I'm, I'm always going to encourage people to try to find a way to create new methods to say the things that we want to say, or at the very least, find interesting ways to mash up the things that we're, we're being influenced uh, by, right? I think there's some value, though, in looking back at the basics, like getting a good handle on the basics. And, you know, obviously, like I was saying before, the crucial fantasy RPG trope, right? The, the, the salt of RPG seasonings is your adventure begins in a tavern. Now, this one is old and it's cliche and it's silly, but it works. It works because it sets a common ground and it allows you to ask for some characterization before the main event. It's a great warm-up scene. It's not a great start to a campaign in the sense that it's like a full chapter of exposition, but as players at a table who are not writing a novel or making a, a movie, instead, what it allows us to do is take a more Apocalypse World-style approach to the beginning. Just take it slow. Not begin with a punch, right? Now, you can say to your players, you've all met in this, this tavern, right? The Inn of the Stinking Pants. And here, in the main room, warm from the hearth, the aforementioned pants nailed up over the fire, each of you meets at the table, following your call to glory, a posted notice for adventuresome folk required to right a terrible wrong that has befallen the land. And then, of course, you ask, while you're waiting for your employer to arrive, what are you doing? Right? What are you doing? What do you do? The crucial, most important question in all of role-playing, because what you do is the, it's the fucking game. Make sure you start the game with that question, whether it's the tavern or, or a mysterious fight or some other thing, whether you're punching the beginning of the game or you're gently easing into it, you have to ask, what do you do? Because in the tavern scene, this can give players a way to express their character outside of a tense moment without duress, right? They can tell you things like what they're drinking. If they're sitting with the group or pacing the floor nervously alone, are they flirting with the busboy? Are they cheating at cards? You're offering them an opportunity to say, when you are here in this tavern moment, introduce your character. What is your character doing? You're inviting the players to characterize in the spotlight and it lets you build a scene or two with those characters before things really kick off. It's essentially a florid, more flavorful variation of what does your character look like, right? The wrong way to do this is to go around the table and say, describe your character out of context, right? Say, tell us what your character is doing and then encourage them to give that context to say, okay, great. So your character is playing the lute by the fire quietly playing a sad tune, just kind of bringing everybody down. That tells us so much about the character, right? We don't know anything about them. And now we know they play the lute. We know they're a bit of a bummer. They're kind of a loner. We're starting to develop characterization through action. So I think that the, the tavern scene can do this. And then when, when you're ready, you can begin with a second phase, which is like the giving of the quest. And the giving of the quest can come from a bunch of different angles but which your own personal twist will bring to life. So remember, even the beating at the end of the Prancing Pony contained a twist. The hobbits were supposed to meet Gandalf, but Gandalf was a no-show. And they met with Strider instead. 
this whole thing is a great time to do a bit of expositing, right? Laying out the quest ahead and then be done with it. Or you can do what I think a lot of people will do if they're going to go with the tavern scene and they're going to introduce a sudden change in direction. So instead of the old man that comes to tell the PCs they need to fight off the demons, have the demons themselves show up and wreck up the tavern, stealing the old man away before he can give you the quest, leaving clues behind, right? This opportunity is a great time for reversal, right? A quest giver gets backstabbed. Someone comes in their stead with an alternate offer. There's a brawl. The city is invaded. The usual D&D chaos erupts. I mean, start a bar fight. Hell, I mean... The PCs might do it for you. There are all kinds of variation on you meet in a tavern. Hell, even Star Wars starts with a tavern. I think that for me, I'm personally pretty done with all the very... I've done them all. All the variations of tavern started adventure. But I think that there is a lot to mine there. If your friends have never started an adventure in a tavern, this can be a gift to them. Do it your own way, right? Now, if we keep looking at D&D, another crucial Dungeons & Dragons trope, one that I quite love, but that is dangerous to use, is the mimic. Everybody has a mimic story. Some mimic stories are funny and silly. Some are scary. Some mimic stories are told with a thousand yard stare, a resigned sigh, and come as a, an admission of one's foolishness. Most players coming into Dungeons & Dragons aren't even going to imagine that it's possible that the chest that they're drooling over is drooling over them too, right? This one is something that you can spring and you want to spring it in a non-bullshit way, right? Deal damage, sure. Frighten them, startle them. But unless you really want to make your players fear Dungeons and & Dragons and totally change the way that they play, don't just be like, the Mimic eats your face. You die. Because what will often happen there is that you are jumping several boundaries at once, right? So imagine, imagine a new player. Imagine you haven't warned them that these things can be possible. So they sit down and they make their character... And they're exploring the dungeon, and they're having a fun time, and they're like, yeah, cool, I'm, I'm playing my character, this is great, I'm having a really fun time, I'm, I'm learning about my character, I'm learning the rules, I don't really know how to play D&D yet, but I'm figuring it out. I'm gonna open, oh, treasure! Oh, oh, hooray, treasure, like, we did a good thing, I'm being rewarded. I'm opening the treasure chest, and now I'm dead. And all those hours of learning, and getting excited, and being engaged, they are gone. They have gone up in smoke. And now instead I feel frustrated and I feel stupid and I feel like I should have known a thing I didn't know and I've made a mistake and maybe the GM thinks I'm bad at role-playing games and the other players don't want to play with me. And it can lead to it can lead to some pretty shitty feelings because not only have you just taught them treasure chests can be mimics, you've taught them you can't trust what you see, you've taught them you can fuck up and die and all your effort can be for nothing. And that's a lot to handle all at once. I'm not saying don't go with save versus death. I'm not saying I'm not saying have real meaningful consequences. I'm just saying you might want to let them know that that's possible first. I think what you really want from the mimic moment is laughter. Nervous laughter, right? Surprise, startlement. You want them to be like, "Wait, what? The treasure chest bites me? How is it even possible?" You want them to to laugh with you about it, not to sob i think tonally and this is just such a weird okay let me give you an, an analogy tonally because you don't want rage or frustration you want giggles essentially you want to be richard gear and you want your players to be julia roberts and you want the mimic to be the jewelry box in pretty woman 
right? You want them to be able to pull their hand back and laugh instead of having their fingers broken. That's the tone you're going for, right? Now, if you're looking for tropes outside Dungeons & Dragons, I think that every, every game, every genre has its own built-in weird tropes that just become part of their expected gameplay for veterans, right? For example, like Shadowrun. So if you've ever played Shadowrun or watched people play Shadowrun or you know about Shadowrun, every single Shadowrun mission ever in the history of time goes like this. You get the mission from Mr. Johnson. You spend several sessions arguing about how to plan the mission. You go on the mission. It doesn't go the way you expected. You succeed at the mission, and then Mr. Johnson tries to fuck you over. Every single fucking time. That is how Shadowrun works. Mirror Shades does not count. It's such a cliche that I don't understand how, in fiction, the entire Shadowrunner economy even functions anymore. I guess... I guess even in the cyberpunk magical future of Shadowrun, we still expect our boss to fuck us over and don't really have much more to do about it than shrug and just do the work. And when Mr. Johnson comes back to betray you, we all nod and it's play along because that's how that works. It's a cliche. It's a trope, right? I think if we want to get a little bit meta about it, I think a lot of these cliches and tropes emerge from recurrent gameplay and the sharing of that gameplay. Like... I don't know that D&D ever said explicitly anywhere that a tavern was a great place to start an adventure. Like, I, I can't, going back and thinking about it, I can't remember the Dungeon Master's Guide edition that says, start at a tavern, it's a great place for an adventure, everybody. Somewhere along the line, we just internalized it as a part of how we play D&D. In the same way we did puckish rogues and sagely wizards and brooding rangers, these old standards stick with us because role-playing is, above and beyond anything else, it's an oral tradition, right? We've moved away from sharing our game stories just via, like, mail and in-person at conventions. We talk about our campaigns online, right? In, in forums and chat servers. We watch each other play. Twitch streams and YouTube channels and podcasts of campaigns are all over the place. We're exposed to so many different ways to start a game, to play through that game and to engage our players that the whole idea of like what a classic D and D goof is, is changing. I think, I think we're starting to see an era where more and more people are learning D and D from a wider and wider set of sources that we're no longer beholden to like, Nights at the dinner table as our primary access to actual play. Which is good. I think that's very, very good. Now, Brian, here's the thing. It's your player's first experience with role-playing. And the most important thing is that you illustrate to them what you love. What we all love about the hobby. Right? You want your friends to have a good time. And... Leaning into classic D&D tropes can be a part of that, but you want to let them guide the ship too. And that's going to take listening skills, right? You lay down a framework of totally awesome fantasy horse shit, but make sure that you're keeping your eyes and ears open for their enthusiasm. Now, that's a really hard thing to do, I think, because there's a lot going on for you already. You're trying to run the game... You're trying to play by the rules. You're trying to just do the thing. But you also want to make sure your players are engaged. And you're, you're kind of invested in showing off the hobby, right? You want them to like the thing you're all doing together. So I would focus more my attention on that. Show them the stuff that you love most about role-playing games. And make sure to let them know their voices are being heard. That their passions are being followed too. Whether you start your adventure in a tavern, whether you go to a dungeon and fight a dragon, what's going to keep them coming back for more is knowing that this is a world that they get to create alongside you. If you're thinking about playing a game like Apocalypse World or award-winning tabletop role-playing game Dungeon World, 
well, you're already on the right path. And if you're looking for an example of me trying to do this, me trying to just get an audience, but also some brand new players, just really hype about role playing, uh, and you're you're willing to tolerate some some silliness, some constrained chaos, uh, definitely check out the the Waypoint seventy two hour launch stream. Uh, the Dungeon World portion of that is very much this. Uh, I think I did a, a pretty okay job. Um, also, Dungeon World is built for this kind of thing. Um, so you're doing the right thing. You're playing the right game, I think, and not leaping into something more complicated. You're not trying to play Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition with all the skills and powers books, right? So I don't know. What about you, chat and or commenters? What do you, what do you think? Like, what's your favorite weird old D&D trope for, for Brian? Because obviously I, I only know some of them. You must know your own. So Brian, check out the check out the comments. Maybe maybe fans have some more ideas for you. Uh, while they while they debate and discuss, let's see what our next question asker has to say. Hi Adam, I'm still new to DMing, but I've been having a lot of fun with my fifth edition D and D group, playing through a homebrew campaign setting that I love to explore, at least myself, lore wise. The issue that I'm having is that I keep getting players either because previous DMs or because of preconceived notions for those who are just getting into Dungeons & Dragons that tell me that we're progressing too slow, that we're not getting enough experience, and that are rushed or too eager to level up and don't seem to realize that experience comes slowly and only when you go out to find it. At least that's how I see it. I like the slow burn of the story and the exploration necessary to really grow as a person or, you know, gain experience. What's the best way to try to find that equilibrium? Is there a good middle space? Should it be sought out? So Ferenox asks uh, an interesting question because I think I think there's some conflation happening here happening here. I think that Ferenox is seeing one thing and uh Ferenox's players are seeing another thing. And I think that there is there's a miscommunication here, right? So this to me, Ferenox, seems less like your players are just having a problem with pacing and more like your whole group is having a preference alignment problem. I think the the simplest solution to this, if you're looking for a neutral third-party intervention, is to look at the game you're playing. The game's rules exist neutrally. The game has no inherent bias in terms of play style that is not present in the mechanisms. Obviously, every game is biased towards the way it wants you to play, and that's written into the rules. But for example... If we look at Dungeon World, anyone who looks at Dungeon World can pretty quickly ga gain an idea of the base level of expected experience, right? So in, in Dungeon World, every session, a party can potentially strive for and obtain uh, one experience point for their alignment, one experience point for each bond, though this is highly unlikely that you're going to clear all your bonds in one session, uh, one to three XP for the end of session questions, plus X amount, where X is how unlucky they are, plus how often they roll. Pacing in Dungeon World is both explicitly laid out, right? Your level, plus 7 XP, gains you a level, and also variable based on play. Aggressive players can aim to get specific actions done to gain XP, but generally you're going to get a level every couple of sessions, which makes a campaign of Dungeon World about 18 to 24 sessions total. We, we tap out at 10, and we expect you and your group probably will too. Lots of games have this, right? I can tell you how much fate you could expect to earn from a given campaign of Burning Wheel. You tell me the number of sessions, I could probably tell you how much fate you will have gained. I could tell you approximately how long in sessions it takes to get from level 1 to level 3 in old school D&D. In 5th edition, there's some 
sort of idea of like how much XP any given encounter should be worth. And you're supposed to be able to multiply that by how many encounters in a given session. And you can kind of guess at how long you'll be at any given level, though that whole system has its own flaws. Folks who are really familiar with the advancement mechanisms of whatever their favorite games are, will be able to work out pacing. And as long as everybody's playing by the rules, there's just no discussion to be had because pacing is determined externally. However, this question isn't about that. What I'm hearing, Fairnox, is that your players want to go fast. They want a game where they gain XP and they gain levels quickly and they want to feel like they're getting powerful, that their ascension to power is expedited. This sort of campaign can be really fun, right? You're on a meteoric rise. You're taking on ever more impressive challenges. It feels like an action movie. You're never stopping on any given plateau long enough to get bored. This is the kind of game that burns bright and moves quick, and it can feel like it's always something new and exciting. And I'm hearing you say that you feel like your players aren't exploring as much as you want and that they're not earning the XP that they expect to gain quickly. And I think... Fairnox, I think that you are thinking about this the wrong way. I think you're thinking about this the wrong way. I give this advice a lot. This is very quickly becoming an office hours aphorism. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay it out again. If you find in your group that all the players want one thing and the GM wants a different thing, the GM is probably the odd one out. The Game Master doesn't get a bigger vote or more say in something like tone or pacing just because they're the Game Master. Now, this isn't to say that you don't deserve to play the kind of game that you want, but if they all agree that's what they want, and you don't, you might have to change the game or change groups to have a campaign with the more contemplative pacing that you seem to be into. Now, that said, I think maybe your group is operating on a false equation here. Like, I don't think getting XP too quickly is a pacing issue the way that you think that it is. It doesn't sound like you don't want them to become powerful or gain abilities or whatever quickly, right? I don't think you don't want what they want. It sounds a little bit like you love the setting. And I don't know if this was a setting you created or you just love it and brought it to the table. But uh, I've heard this problem before and I've felt this way where you love the setting and it feels to you like your players only want XP and gold. They're not paying attention to this thing that that you've created or brought to them. It sounds to me like you're asking them, hey, let's spend a whole session in town just looking at the scenery and learning about our characters. And they're saying, fuck you, we want experience points. It's possible that what we're seeing here isn't pacing as an issue at all, but an issue of priority and desire. Now, if you're feeling like I'm just talking on my ass and the problem really is about XP and advancement, then the solution for you is simple, right? Sit down with your players, look at the rules the game is giving you and say, I think you're leveling too fast. And they're going to say, I think you're leveling too slow. And you're going to work it out at the table. The rules will help you adjudicate that. I don't see that as your actual issue, though. I think you're going to need to talk about what's really going on here. Divested alternate desires. You want your players to explore the lore. You want to feed it to them slowly in bits and pieces. You want them to have a 10-course meal of exciting things about the world, one little bite at a time. They want experience. They want to level up. They want to see their characters advance. Now, you say experience comes slowly, but why do you think that's true? Growing as a person... And gaining experience in 5th edition have nothing to do with one another. Getting XP and leveling up have nothing to do inherently 
with learning about the setting. Going from level 1 to level 10 in Dungeons & Dragons can be done with exactly zero knowledge or exposure to lore, characters, or setting, save whatever's on the bloody end of your sword. This is all to say that you can have what you want, you just need to stop tying progress to exploration of the setting. There's a creative solution here that's going to take you and your players sitting and talking to work it out, but I want to help you and GMs like you who are feeling like the players don't appreciate the setting the way you want them to get your head into the right place before you go into that conversation, right? Your players want to feel like they're advancing at a decent pace. To do this, they need to, rules is written, be overcoming danger on a regular basis. They need to have adversaries, they need to fight monsters, they need to push forward past those challenges and get treasure to arm themselves for the next conflict. You want them to be exposed to the machinery of the world, learn the lore of the setting and changes that grow as people, right? I have to tell you, as written, they want what D&D wants and you don't. In the sense that one of the two of you have behavioral sets in line with D&D's goals and the other is playing the game wrong. So I could suggest to you, you stop playing D&D and play something more character focused instead. Uh, Dungeon World and Torchbearer both do character focused dungeon fucking better than D&D does, both in very different ways. But I think you and your group probably want to stick with 5e. So here's what you might have to do. Either you find a way to be satisfied with the pace they want to play at, introduce challenges, give them things to overcome that originate in the lore and the setting of the world in a way that feels satisfying to you. Instill in them a sense of understanding of the lore in the things they're killing, the challenges they're overcoming, the dangerous places that they're going, right? That is the lore you are allowed to expose them to in terms of them fighting monsters and getting experience and playing the game. Or else, change the model for experience rewards. Now, personally, I'm going to be straight up here. Personally, I hate Milestone XP. I hate it. I would not recommend it. But you could use the goal XP thing that I use in Court of Swords to give your players concrete stuff to quest after, right? Things that tie them to the world, tie them to the lore. You could create your own model of advancement where the players get XP for engaging with the world around them in a meaningful way. Remember, whatever you do, D&D still cares about fighting first and foremost. But if you want what you want and you want to encourage your players to want what you want, you'll have to make a change because D&D as it is wants the same thing that they do. Aggressive pursuit of experience points by murder or avoiding being murdered by combative assailants, right? Root your game in the world. Give your player reasons to care about what you care about and stick to it. Whatever your solution, you're going to need to work on it with your players. Don't just bring it to the table and tell them this is how it is. Everybody is equally a part of this thing together, so you all get a say that matters as much as everyone else's. Play by the rules. Change the rules if you can. Or just change the game entirely if changing the rules won't work. I feel like 99% of all GM player conflict just comes from this, from like, I want this and you want that. And we're not either of us satisfied. Don't compromise. Find a new thing that you both want. This is the kind of shit that, that is relationship advice, pretending to be D and D advice. Let's take a look at our third question. We're going to get a little, we're going to get a little bit loosey goosey on this one. I like this one a lot. Hi Adam, I have a question about what to do when you feel your game has run away from you. Um, I don't mean this in the sense of feeling like you have lost control over the narrative. Uh, I mean this in the sense of feeling overwhelmed by the possibilities, I suppose. Um, in my case it's about scope. I'm running 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons and I feel I can run it quite competently up to I don't know, maybe level 10, somewhere, somewhere around there. But now we're level 16, and what that means, both narratively and mechanically, is just completely overwhelming to me. And I feel like I just, no matter what I do, I can't get a grip on it. Um, so preparing for it feels like an absolute nightmare. Uh, now, while that's about scope, I feel like this can apply to things like tone or thematics of your game. Just in general, what do you do 
when you feel like you have lost control and feel overwhelmed by your own game. Thank you. This has happened to me in every single Apocalypse World game I have ever played. Ever. 100% of my Apocalypse World games have this happen in them. We start with a relatively small and intimate scope and scale. Apocalypse World begins about a community of people, some of whom are kind of weird, trying to survive and continue existing in a post-apocalypse. The first few episodes feel like they're about the people in the setting. Humans interacting, people having simple desires and pursuits. And as the game goes on, it gets weirder and weirder and bigger and bigger and more significant until we're breaking through the maelstrom and we're fucking around in the big bad weird. And every fucking time that I start a campaign of Apocalypse World, I say to myself, this time, this time I'm going to stop the escalation to weirdness. This time we're going to stay down here in the community. And every fucking time I fail without fail every single time. Now, is it me who is making a mistake? Am I doing something wrong? Am I unable to manage the scope of the game? Am I so out of touch? No, it is Apocalypse World that is wrong. And this is true. Mechanically, Apocalypse World just does this. It gets weirder and weirder because of the way that the moves work. I could try and make it not that way, but if I don't change those rules, the fiction will unstoppably redline in to the weird zone, whether I like it or not. If I want a game that stays in the smaller scale, community-oriented, non-weird fiction, I can make adjustments to the mechanisms, I can change how the game works, I can run game, uh, run the game using moves that keep my apocalyptica barfing to a low grade, but that's going to take more effort than just letting it happen. Now, sometimes, sometimes it isn't the game that instigates this stuff, it's the players, right? If I think about examples, the, the first and most obvious one that jumps to mind is Blood Letters, right? The game of Blades in the Dark that I played with John, Strash, and Sean, right? So when we started the game, I'd expressed my desire to keep it relatively street level, right? Not get too weird. I wanted a game where we did crimes and were thugs. The group agreed. And when Strash made Weird Boy, this strange arcane nerd, it was a form of niche protection for that character, right? Yes, you can be the token weird character, right? You can be the Mr. Spock while we're all being humans. Strash was able to focus on the weird stuff and we focused the rest of the game elsewhere. However, at one point in the game, I could feel the narrative getting weirder and weirder. And I could feel R.C., Sean's character. I could see R.C. starting to do weird stuff, too. And at one point, I had to speak up and say, Hey, so I'm feeling the game slip away from our original intended tone. We're getting into this magic demon place really hard. And I'm asserting a boundary. I'm going to X card this demon stuff. No, it wasn't easy saying to people that the creative fun they were having was stepping on my creative fun, especially because I was outnumbered, so to speak. Thankfully, the people that I was playing with and hopefully the people you play with 
were really cool and they were having fun with the not weird stuff too. And they were open to hearing me ask them to like dial it back and not let it go all apocalypse world. Blades doesn't do that mechanically. Players and GMs make Blades do that. It went really well for us, and I got what we wanted, and we still had a good time with the campaign. You're allowed to say, X card, no, I don't, I don't want this. People think that the X card is only there for stuff that's going to cause them psychological trauma, right? Yes, the X card is great for like, hey, can we tone down the sexual assault? Hey, no more spiders or sharks or being lit on fire or having your eyeballs popped out with a spoon. Right? No, the X, you can X card that stuff. That's a good reason for it. But the X card is also there for like, hey, you're, you're fucking up my good time. Right? It's a way to say, no, stop. We agreed as a group. We agreed as a group that this would not be a campaign about like weird stuff in Duskwall. It wouldn't be summon ghosts and throw lightning bolts and do all that shit. This would be a game about doing crimes. And yes, it's Duskwall, so there'd be some weird stuff, but that's not the focus of the game. So my X card there was, no, y'all were, were deviating in a way that's making this not fun for me anymore. So it's pulling it back to the place that we originally agreed to be in, right? Had I not said anything, we could have gotten to a place where the game was RC and Weird Boy doing magic and me being like, but what about the drugs and guns, y'all? The reason that I am enjoying playing, why, why, like, what about that? I could feel that change coming. I addressed it as a player at the player level. The game wasn't pushing us in one way or another, but the emergent narrative can sometimes just get away. It can head in another direction. Now, as a GM, I have a tendency, too, to do the big stuff when I feel like I want to bring significance to a campaign. I tend to make calls in the moment that later I realize, well, I have fundamentally changed the campaign world or the direction of this narrative in an irreversible way. I tend to do this in a way that escalates things rather than making lateral moves. And it can lead me to being in a place where I get that exact same feeling that you described. That feeling of like, well, shit, I just fucked up the campaign setting in a really deep way. And now what the hell do I do? I get wary of that these days. And I find that it helps check me, right? Before I go jumping in with the big world changing shit, I have to sit down and ask myself questions about what I'm leaving behind. This can be on the small scale, right? If you give your players a magic ring that lets them teleport across the world once a day, you instantly lose out on all the stories you could have told about overland travel. Dusty days on the road, random encounters, You've, th you've thrown it away. That's gone now. This can be a big thing, too. Destroy a planet. Destroy a kingdom. You lose all the stories you could tell with that planet and with their kingdom. Right? The inhabitants. All those things are gone. You're going to get something else in their place, right? The post-apocalyptic ruined planet. The kingdom under siege becomes the kingdom destroyed. But you've fundamentally changed the scope, scale, and tone of your game by doing that. What's important is to keep hold on what gives you passion for the game. Whether that's about mechanisms or narrative or themes. Don't give up the stuff that feels important or significant to you. And don't make decisions lightly that affect other people's stuff, right? This, this goes back to Luke's advice in Burning Wheel about not giving people what they want in their beliefs. Like, if I write a belief that says, I will get revenge for the death of my son, if you're like, cool, uh, ch episode one, ch chapter one, the man who killed your son stands before you, bleeding from his throat, what do you say to him before he dies? You, you fucked that up. That's a goof. Don't do that. Be aware, not just by reading their minds, but by asking what the players care about in the world. Let them tell you. And then don't throw that stuff away or don't change it so fundamentally that the game gets away from the group. In an environment like role-playing games where improv is seen as this sort of paramount skill and thinking on our feet is valued super highly, we need to be aware that sometimes fucking putting the brakes on can be really helpful, right? 
And this is true of players. It's true of GMs. Dodger did this really recently, and I'm so proud of her for it. She had a big decision to make in character. Big, world-changing, campaign-ending decision to make. And instead of making that decision in the moment and maybe regretting how it came out, she asked me to take a break to think about it. As GMs, I think it's even harder for us because we can often feel like we're meant to be the expert. We're meant to feel like if we're good at our job, we shouldn't need to pause. We shouldn't need to take a minute. But screw that. That's false. That's a lie. You're allowed to take all the time that you need. You need to learn when you start feeling those feelings of being overwhelmed, right? How to read yourself and to know when to ask for a second. It's better to do that now than to realize two sessions later that you goofed up a thing that you, you thought you had under control, but maybe could have used some time. If you're overwhelmed by narrative, ask to buy some time. If you're overwhelmed by crunch, if you're overwhelmed by, by rules, and Jesus, a lot of games get more and more crunchy as you progress, right? They get more and more complex, and they, it can get away from you. You know, when I was making notes for this episode, I was thinking about this is what I love or one of a long list of things about what I love about Burning Wheel. Once you've introduced the relevant subsystems, Burning Wheel will never get any more complex. It just is what it is. And you can functionally play forever without worrying that suddenly it's going to be level 200 and you don't know how to do the math anymore. If you're hitting a mechanical complexity wall and you don't want to create another CR appropriate challenging encounter for a 20th level party with several hundred abilities apiece, listen to what your brain is telling you and fucking do something about it. You could stop your campaign at any time. A D&D campaign that ends at level five is still a campaign worth playing. It's as much worth playing as a campaign that ends at level 20, level 10, or level 3, for that matter. You get to choose the game window that you prefer. You can play level 5 to level 10 and quit. You can do 1 to 20 if that's fun. Just because the game covers level 1 to 20 doesn't mean you have to play all of them. It's not quitting. It's not copping out or being a bad DM to just say, Dungeons and Dragons stops being fun for me at level 10. So when we get there, I'm going to stop GMing. This is the thing you can do. It's totally okay. Stopping play is always preferable to having a miserable time. No game at all is always better than playing a bad game. I promise you. As far as theme and tone go, this is a really slippery thing to try to nail down as any kind of controllable progression I think that it's probably best to keep checking in with the players. Is this still the game we wanted to play? And with yourself, am I planning things that stay within our agreed upon tone? And then just let the moment guide you in the game. The thing is, when it comes to tone, nothing is irreversible. A scene or a moment that violates tone without really fucking up the narrative doesn't ruin your game. Now, I think if you've been watching Roll20 Presents, both Tomb of Annihilation and Burning Wheel, you've seen this recently. Uh, in Tomb, the cartoony nature of the game was, for a little bit, bent out of shape, right? The players started taking the game seriously in a way that the narrative hadn't supported. We were playing a Saturday morning cartoon that suddenly got weirdly serious, and so we talked as players and reoriented ourselves to a place where the game felt good again. And we had to do that intentionally. That was an on-purpose decision. In the other example, in Burning Wheel, the game drifted into a weird supernatural place when we'd originally intended, yes, a magic-heavy but intrigue-focused game. A character left the campaign, and we brought in a new one. We turned down the weird dial and agreed not to push too hard back towards the magic stuff. And it's been great. But that was, that was work. We did that. Tone will change. And as I said previously in the episode about theme way back when, theme can be derived before play or after or just during. Right? Theme isn't something you necessarily bring to the table every time. 
I think that with tone and runaway, it's more about understanding the table, right? Working with your players, checking in regularly. And it's easy enough to deviate back to where you want the game to be. Remember, nothing is exclusively your responsibility. And if you need help narratively or mechanically, you can just ask your players. And if you say you don't want to do it anymore, that's okay. You're allowed to just say, all right, this game has gotten to a place where I don't want to play it anymore. Um, someone else could take over or uh, we could start a new campaign. But like, I'm, I'm satisfied. I'm good. Level 10 is all I need. I want to tell you, Nicholas, nothing in a game needs to feel like a nightmare. That's a, that's a big red flag to me. If you're describing your games as feeling like a nightmare. And when I feel like I've lost control or feel overwhelmed, I remember that I have friends, I have allies in this game. We're all in it together. I talk to those people. I give the game and myself some space. And I try to remember that it's not my job to make the game good. It's everyone's job. And to that end, it's, it's cool that you've reached out uh, to me because you don't, you don't have to do it by yourself, whatever that looks like. There are communities at your table. There are communities outside your table that are here and that are ready to help. Starting with this nerd. So I hope that I have. This has been episode number 63 of Office Hours. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Uh, I hope that my advice has been helpful. You've had an opportunity to think a little bit about tropes, about pacing, about tone. I hope you had a fun time. Thank you for coming. If you have questions, uh, I know I saw some in chat. Uh, this isn't the kind of show where I'm going to do like Q&A stuff with the audience. So if you want to get involved, do what I said. Go to the website, adam cobblecom Click the Office Hours link. Fill out the form. Record your voice. Do the thing. And... Uh, eventually, I will get to uh, I will get to your question. Um, and just remember, you and me, question asker, we're not just here to help you. We're here to help everybody. And the problems that you're having, I bet you they're the problems other people are having too. So thanks for coming, everybody. We will see you next time for episode number 64 of Office Hours. <laughs>